Hello and welcome to the latest Mad Axman podcast. This week I'm joined by Dave and by Richard and what we're doing for you this week is to dive into the Republican and Camillan Roman lists. These are two of um, the classic lists of, of history, Romans, big red shields, all that kind of stuff, but also they're two of the lists that many people pick up when they start and eventually throw away. They can't quite make them work. So we've given ourselves the challenge of trying to turn both of these um, famous yet notoriously difficult to build lists into proper viable lists for in period and possibly even slightly broader competition and that's what we're going to do for you over the next hour and a bit so sit back and enjoy the podcast this means war Well, look, welcome to another um, in our ongoing series of slightly left field list podcasts. Um, maybe it's a new specialist subject after our trying to make hot light armies good last week. We're going with another classical era classic. It's those early Roman lists this week that, that everybody kind of starts with and everybody's got. It, you know, they're, they're the war gamers staple, the proper Hastati, Principes, Triarii, the Velites. All of those early Roman lists, which in, in ADLG are, are lists 52 and 53, um, but the numbers don't matter so much. It's the Camillan and then the post-Camillan Republican in the era from 400 BC up to 105 with, um, with the, the reorganizations um, of Camillus, the beginning of the Punic Wars, um, the wars against Pyrrhus, and then, then their classic wars around the Mediterranean against Carthage, Macedonia, Seleucids, all of that sort of stuff, and, and even pushing into Germany um, and taking on the Teutones um, just before Marius starts his his reforms, really. Um, so it's, there have always been, as I say, lists that everybody's got. Um, for for figure manufacturers, they're the the must do thing. I, I think I've, it's difficult to keep count of the number of plastic figure manufacturers in twenty eight mil who are making stuff for for this particular army as well so it's it's got to be popular for for some sort of reason but they always struggle to actually be successful and um you know maybe they're a victim of of the army following on i guess from the hoplites last time we we talked about the hoplites being a bridge from the chariot era to the the post hoplite era and then the romans can potentially only be who they they put in front of them but you know it's an interesting period of of a big change from from a sort of hoplite army to the proper throwing stuff and charging into people with a sword um, roman army but just about before it starts to get um clever and all arms and having decent cavalry so so it's where the legionary is king um so this period of history for the romans from sort of 400 to a to 105 the, these reforms um joined of course by by dave and richard but you know uh, richard is this um you know, an era yeah you know, have you got this collection or is this one that's weirdly skipped you by or is this one that you like all of us have got the same same figures for i i certainly got re- an army that i built to be republicans and you know by and large can be used uh as camillans and that's because i think one of the first periods I really got interested in, in in ancient warfare was the rise of Rome. So first of all, the wars against the Carthaginians and then against the Macedonians, uh, and then going on to to face the Spanish and the Gauls and so on. So I think you have a lot of different opponents that they can fight. And I think what's it's also compared to many periods very well documented. So we have quite a lot of detailed information um which i think is such a contrast and what always surprises me is the the sheer size of some of the armies that we are pretty confident were fielded you know to think you know forces in the sort of 50 to 80,000 aside i mean you know in pre-industrialized times to actually manage the communication and control and logistics and everything it's a, it's a pretty amazing army yeah you know just just even putting that many people into into a football stadium, well, clearly it's beyond us all at the moment. Um, but but logistically, to assemble those sorts of armies, you're you're used to looking at historical, classical, ancient um, sources and thinking, yeah, yeah, those numbers are vastly overinflated. But but this is the real deal, isn't it? This is proper organisation, putting things putting things into the field 
in in a very organised way against quite big opposing armies as well. In as well, and, and the amazing thing uh, about the Roman army was its ability against Hannibal to sometimes sustain tens of thousands of losses and yet be able to put an, another army uh, in, into the field. Mm. I mean, there has been quite a lot of work done on calculating Roman m- military manpower pool. Um, you know, so, and I think it's about 800,000 or something, and it's that sheer scale, and often they would win by, it's almost like the First World War, it's a war of attrition. The Romans can keep recruiting legions faster than their opponents and that's in the even if they have a few disasters they can bounce back whereas their opponents have to keep winning because they don't often have that well of skilled manpower i think it's that skill that's the interesting thing about the whole set of reforms that moved them from being a a hoplite style army into the, the roman army they became over this this 300 year period and it's kind of, it does fascinate me who, you know, who sat there, although I guess the name's obviously in, in one of the lists, but to sit there and go, everybody else is walking up to each other and poking each other with a stick from behind the shield. We will invent what looks like sort of either, an, either a new way of fighting entirely or, or kind of a more effective um, hybrid way of, of doing what the barbarians do, but, but train people to do it now. How does that happen? I, I think, I mean, there's, there's a little bit of uh, confusion on, on, on whether that's uh, certain or not. But I think generally the view is that facing the Etruscans and the Campanians, who are mainly hoplites, hoplites were fine. But it's when you start to face the people in List 47, the Italian hill tribes, the Samnites and the Oscans and people like that, who, and you're fighting them often in more broken ground, uh, and some of them are using peeler-like weapons that the Romans are forced to evolve. Often, they, they rarely originate. They're a bit like Apple. They aren't the first one to come up with the idea, but they're very fast copiers, and because of their organisation, they're, they're able to very quickly institutionalise new ways of warfare. But Dave, what do you think? Oh, it's, it's, it's definitely... So, I mean, I think the thing to say is that, um, like the armies of Alexander, we know a lot about this period from Polybius, who's a Greek historian. He writes later, but he tells us about the reforms under Camillus, which changes them from a sort of semi-historical, hoplite form of warfare. They, they, they develop the legion, which is very important. And that's, you know... As we said before, we, when we talked about hoplites before, these are citizen militias which are raised. And he explains how they have different orders. So you have, you know, the light troops come from the cheapest, um, lowest class of people. Then you have three ranks of infantry, Hastati, Principes and Triari, depending on how much money they have, with the Hastati being the most... So that when it begins... They're all hoplites and it's, it's interaction with the Samnites and be, being defeated by the Samnites on a regular basis, which leads them to change their tactics and develop the front rank, the Hastati, into sword, sword troops. And fighting, as, as Richard says, they fight in a more open order. They form, form a, a, like five points of a five-sided die, you know, five on a dice. They split up and spread out so they can fight over... Um, broken landscape and they and this is where they you get the classic legionary who fights in a two meter square whereas a hoplite stands shoulder to shoulder shield to shield with his mates now we're we're talking about individuals fighting in an open order and fencing in in actual fact they're fencing there's you know that that implies a almost a you know a massive step change in in competence um to to stand to train someone to stand shoulder to shoulder, overlapping shields and and poke a stick at someone while you all shuffle forward, you know, I'm 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 slightly dissing the hoplite world there, but um, but to actually be able to stand in a in a space and use a shield and a sword and fence and do so, that is such a massive a massive step change. Um, was that a cultural thing? You know, how was it just economics, culture? What what? 
what tipped the balance on that to to enable that to be done at scale and move from these kind of levied but it's a kind of thing that you do citizen armies of of shoulder to shoulder and but we only really work in a group to this more individual fencing scale style but but done at scale i think if i start on that i think richard's right there's an also a factor of we're, we're, we're shifting from an army of maybe five to 10,000 to armies which are much larger. And another key point is the Roman legion is created, but very early on, Rome is now sort of taking other cities in board and creating its own sort of little empire. Begin, you know, the Roman Republic is beginning to become an Italian, a Republic of Italians. So half the army is Roman. You know, typical Roman army is one legion of Roman citizens and one legion of Italian citizens. And they need to fight in a similar manner. So I, I think one of the arguments is that the Romans are adopting what the other Italians fight as tactically as well. Mm -hmm. So they can mirror. So their army mirrors itself. So would, that, I, would it be fair to say that, that, you know, or, or describe you know, this concept of the Legion is almost about um, setting up like a, a company. It's almost about privatizing the, um, the recruitment of, of the army and saying, this is a permanent organization that has a life of its own and, and its personnel kind of, you know, move through it over time. But it's got a degree of, it's got a culture, it's got, but it's got a degree of almost management autonomy that gives it, gives it the responsibility for training at a, a more lower level? That really only happens much later. So we, we've really, we have, the reason it's split in 275 is, you know, up until that point, it is very much Rome and then Rome plus the Latin cities fighting other Italians. And it's only really as they begin to interact with the Carthaginians and with Pyrrhus that they start, to be pulled into, into uh, activity outside of Italy. So in that early period, the Legion usually only existed for one campaign season and was then disbanded and was re-raised, as right. Dave said. Uh, uh, and I think the other thing that, that counts is that the armies were normally led by the two consuls who were only appointed for a year. So the legions were raised by them for that year. And then everybody had to go home for harvest because this was a peasant, you know, a lot of the people in the army in that era were the citizen farmers around the city. And what changes over time is the pressures of international warfare, meaning the legions need to be raised for several years and some of, and as you move towards Marius, the the Romans start to struggle to get enough manpower. So they remove the property qualification that Dave mentioned earlier. And some of the some of the soldiers then become 10, 15, 20 year veterans, and it becomes normal for their general to be responsible for their pension, for settling them on land. Right. And and that's really how you get eventually in, in a slightly later period under Pompey and Caesar, you get the slow dissolution of the Republic uh, because the citizen sh soldier has changed so dramatically from how he was in the third century. Okay. The Roman army is incredibly mixed up in their politics and their city state politics. The two are entrenched every year they go to war. They have a, a festival where they, they, they kind of declare war every year and they write that and they decide who they're going to go and pick on. And, uh, but I think as you said, the other interesting thing is it's a very quick period where these armies increase in massive scale. We go, we go from a period which is prehistoric. We don't really have much record for, for it very quickly into an era of like huge armies fighting each other out and the conquest of Italy. This, and we we're talking about a period much later than Greek history in actual fact. Okay, so so actually then that um, annualization of war um, and and I guess the fact the Italian cities are, are kind of close and able to be taken over one by one um, creates an, an opportunity for 
for professionalism by default, rather than if you look at some of the other armies of antiquity, you know, there were wars, but when they were levying people together, it was kind of, right, guys, we've got to train up an army kind of quickly and, and assemble it, but but it's only going to be used once or twice, and then and we've got some years of peace. Whereas Rome, with, with an annualised war, does suddenly sort of slide towards professionalism and then um, realises that professionalism is kind of the way forwards. Um, although whether it's real professionalism or whether it's land grants and, and just experience is, you know, is, is a semantic point in some ways. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's that uh, there's enough wars that certain people begin to see war as their profession. Yes. Right. Okay. That's probably a good way of doing it. Well, look, let's um, let's move on and, and look at some of the lists. This means war. This means war. So, Dave, let's um, let's do this in order. Um, there's some weird alphabetical order thing going on here. So. This is your Camillan. We're going to look, actually, in this podcast, we're going to look at a Camillan army each um, and a Republican Roman army each. We're, we're potentially, although I think, Richard, you are not, but we're, we're ignoring the, the advisory um, on structure, certainly myself and Dave are, um, that, that is purely advisory in the army lists. And we've also set ourselves the, the artificial constraint of we're only allowing... Um, one ally across either of, of these two lists. So either the Camillans or the Republicans may have an ally. So Dave, we're starting with your your first um, list, the Camillan one. So so just looking at this, you've got, um, what have we got? We've got zero initiative. That's, um, that's impressive. You've uh-huh. got 26 units and you're an 11, a 7 and a 7 there with a, a competent ordinary ordinary. So, so talk us through, um, you know, describe this first command, your second command, your third command, and, and how you see this all working. Okay, so first command is six Astarte, who are heavy swordsmen, armor impacts. So they're the full Monty. The only thing they're not is elite. So this, this is the strike force. This is the troops which are going to go forward and hopefully win the game. Um, they're wide enough to be as wide as anybody else's command. You know, six wide is as much as a general command can do. Um, the general's included just to save points. Um, he sits behind the line. He's going to be sitting there behind the line. Um, I've got Javelin Man as I keep nattering on about to give width to that command and a couple of Velites who are there just to, again, to give width, to fight in front and to take terrain. Um, my real idea of this list is it's 26, which is quite a large army. And I'm, hope, I'm, I'm, I'm counting on the fact that I'm going to be defending with the math minimum initiative. I'm going to look towards having quite a bit of terrain. Um, I want to get some terrain to hide my medium troops in and fight from. And I want to, I want to use the terrain to give hard flanks to my fighting troops. Okay, so um, you've got, you've got six Astarte in the first one, as we say, and, yeah. and a couple of javelin men to widen it out, a medium cavalry reserve as well. Um, yeah. Your second command is, so that's, that's kind of another fighting command then, isn't it? Yeah, so the, the, the first command is Astarte, who are the front line troops. The second line, second command is the Principes, who are in a, in a classical Roman army are the second line, plus the Triari, who are the last line. But I think in actual fact, a, a Roman army of this time would contact with the Hastati and then bring out the Principes to give width and then envelop the enemy. So this is what it is. So this second command's objective is to give width to the army and to extend the line out. So I'm hoping that uh, I can, you know, what I'm looking at is six Hastati wide strike force, then another four spearmen of which one is armoured and Elite, elite to give width again and then hopefully if i've got the width again to add two medium spearmen mediocre wide again to try and envelop the flank 
So are you, are you seeing those drifting into terrain along with the javelin men or are, are they there to provide overlaps once your other four are engaged? Because, you know, four spearmen's a decent enough block anyway, isn't it? No, it's not bad. I mean, well, the other thing that's an interesting point here is that heavy swordsmen can go through terrain. If it's yes. field, if, you're face, if you were fighting a Gallic army or, you know, when, if a Gallic army comes towards you, there's, there's a, an often a feeling of like, right, okay, I've got lots of medium infantry. I'll sit in terrain and just face them off and they won't come in. Well, heavy swordsmen can go through terrain and they only get a minus one. And considering they're a plus one for being a swordsman and plus one for impact, they're just even on fighting with a lot of other troops. And if you're six wide, so it may, you know, I think in reality, the spear command, the second command is the command which is going to sit out of terrain and hold while my mm. Astarte and my third command of medium troops do the fight, the real fighting here. Yeah, because this is a big, well, this is a sort of strangely big, isn't it? It's, it's got seven in it. Um, they're all Latin auxiliaries, pretty much. You've got two elite medium swordsmen, three normal medium swordsmen, and, and a couple of mediocre javelin men as well. Um, so yeah, that's that's a lot of stuff. That's seven wide to put into terrain of stuff that can either can or can just about fight sure. as well. I'm, I'm thinking there that again we have this. You know, there's often a um, you know if you have a medium cavalry, medium infantry command to take to hold to take and to hold terrain. There's always a kind of um, an arms race for medium yeah. troops. You know, if you go with an army of three medium swordsmen and find yourself facing four, then it's yeah. uh -oh, you're in trouble. Yeah, then you're in trouble. Yeah. So let's go for five <clears throat> yeah. and two javelin men. And all of a sudden, that's a very, very nice, you know, <clears throat> it, that can actually survive contact with an enemy of heavy foot. Yeah. That's, it's not going to meet anything bigger, is it? It's not going to meet anything bigger than that at all. No. And, and you, I'm hoping that if he does have to come out into the open, I'm going to have at least the two javelin men running around free. You know, in this yeah. army, I've got three light troops. Everything yeah. else is 23 battle troops, in, a, in actual fact. All right, some may be mediocre, but, you know, my, my, my idea is that I extend the line as far as I can, fight with the Hastati, fight with the spearmen, and then use the other troops to try and envelop round. Um, I've got, okay. you know, these armies have got very poor and very weak cavalry. There's kind of no point in trying to compete on the cavalry. The cavalryman I've got in the first command is there purely because he's compulsory. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. Richard, um, what's what's your kind of thoughts looking at this one? Is it um, is it kind of what you expected? Is it is it a bit left field? No, I I, I think there's a lot of pluses. Uh, in it, the sh as Dave said, the sheer size uh, is a plus. I think actually one of those Latin javelin men probably should be an extensi because you've actually got nine Latins and you're only allowed eight, but you can easily substitute a mediocre javelin man for a mediocre spearman, uh, yeah. which would sort that out, no problem. Um, I my, my problem doing lists is that I like to try and be historical rather than what the lists say. And the Hastati were generally the younger, poorer men than the princeps. So if anyone was gonna have armor, it would be them. So, but that's nothing to do with the legality of the list. That's just my personal hangups. Um, and I would be, I guess the thing would slightly worry me is the lack of command ability it's it if your line is punctured which its breadth because it's not going to be outlapped because it's so wide but if it is punctured it's got limited ability to respond they've got a lot of second line troops which will help with that and in the first the sort of key battle winning command including the general in a unit that probably won't fight um just means he's not free to go and help rally the armoured impact swordsman in the line. So that would be a slight concern. But I think it's very much an army of line them up and just by the sheer breadth, expect to grind the opponent down. And I think you would have an excellent chance of doing that. Yeah, I think in, you know, and this 
army historically was all about fighting the other Italian states armies, wasn't it? So yes. it, you kind of know historically what it's going to come up against. And, um, <coughs> you know, that this army existed in quite a small bubble of potential different opponents, which yes. whilst it's the classic army or, you know, or perhaps one before the, the classic army, it, it always has to be looked at in the context of it's going to be taking on, similar-ish armies and, and things that are a bit more kind of speary. So those six armoured swordsman impact is is just very, very strong. That's as good as it gets in this period, and it's going to yep. wade through. Um, and as you say, 26 is is very significant. I, I do like that that final core with, um, okay, two are mediocre, but seven wide, yeah, that that's more than anyone else will put into the rough. And all of a sudden... You're turning everybody's, um, you know, here's my three infantry that I'm going to hold a flank while my heavy infantry win. Suddenly they become a target and all of that rough terrain starts becoming um, a liability, both in terms of eroding the enemy's uh, break point, but also making their flanks insecure as well. Um, but yeah, I think I, I'm probably with you that 26 is a lot, um, whether 25 and a bit more command and control or 25 and, and not making that, um, that guy included would be a, a thing. Um, I'm possibly a bit sceptical about the Ascensi as medium spearman mediocre. I, th I think that might be too many um, layers of not very goodness um, sat on the shoulders of one particular troop type. There's, there's possibly other ways of doing them, but, but it's a big army and it's got a couple of cute things and, shove those six Astarte in someone's face and, um, and put seven medium foot through terrain on a flank. And those are two things that are going to be very difficult for anyone else to deal with. And, and that third command with four heavy spearmen, one, one of them's elite and armoured, that's going to hang on while the other two do their job. I, I, I can very much see that. This means war. So, Richard, your first list. Take it away. So the first command has, as you say, a legion. Uh, I've gone, I've up-armoured all of the troops in this um, because, again, I, I feel if you're up-armouring the Hastati, you ought to up-armour the Principes. Um, so, so each is one... A, has... Is that a tactical thing? Or, you know, do you want them to say, sod it, they're all armoured? Or is that just your your kind of stylistic... I want them all That's my stylistic down. thing of saying, well, the okay. principes were richer. If, if you know, typically the Treari would actually afford mail and the others would have various bits of bronze uh, tacked on the front of them. Uh, maybe some mail am amongst the principes. Um, but I think also it just makes it easier to play the game. You don't have to think. All the heavy infantry are armoured. Boom. There's no question about, oh, is yeah. this unit that? Have I got the right one in the right place? I quite like mixing the spear and impact because if you do face um you know even in this period if if you face an army of whether it's gauls or carthaginians with more mounted you've got the swordsman impact to take on warband but you've got the spear to take on mounted so each command can stand in the open against almost anything and have a survivability and a threat capability. Yeah, one, one, could... one elite one elite armored spearman will really make the anti-mounted capability of a couple of swordsmen, um, even if it stood next to them, better. But yeah, with with three armored swordsmen, sorry, armored spearmen, one of which is elite, you're you get them in the right place. You're absolutely shoving away a lot of mounted. But I guess at the exactly. expense of um, at the at the expense of um, Hastato. Yes. But, you know, as, as I, the, they had legions. I, I, I mean, there are times when for numbers you might want to drop one, but I think to broadly respect the balance is, is in the spirit of the period. Yeah. And for me, that's half the fun, you know, yeah. I, I, otherwise why, why pick a particular, I, I don't always pick a list to win. I'll pick a list because I feel some level of historical interest in the army. Uh, and so I like to, to research it a bit and, and to take, take that approach. 
you can argue that the, the Velites aren't fully useful if the heavy infantry is armoured, but it just extends your, your rough terrain capability, particularly since you've got mountains. And, you know, if you think you're going to face somebody with lots of medium infantry, you can discomfort them by putting down a few steep hills um, and then try and dominate the open. How, how, does this, how does this army get played, though? You know, because that classic structure say, yes, everything's got armour and, and we've got some different capability in each command. But, but how do you play this? Clearly, the terrain is, is a part of it because it's, it's got that ability to contest rough terrain. And, and certainly your third command, which we've not, not quite talked about yet with, um, with warriors and stuff, looks like a kind of a, a version of Dave's terrain command as well. It is, but I actually like having one medium cavalry because very little terrain is seven wide. A lot is four wide, maybe five wide. Having one cavalry in there, I mean, that will really chew up mediocre javelinmen and will give all, all, just ordinary medium swordsmen a hard time. So I just think it gives you an edge over somebody who's only bought a medium foot army. I, I always like to combine one or two mounted with with a large medium foot command because it just extends their capability into the open a little more and it gives you a little bit more speed to get around the flank to threaten a camp if uh, if the camp isn't fortified but generally this this is about using the three commands probably fairly together if you had a bit of rough terrain on one wing you'd send command three into it and then hang the other two on it the first command has the javelinmen and the medium cavalry more to act as sweepers. You know, they yes. wouldn't be in the first line. They could threaten the flank if you want to delay the second command. They can hold the, the open flank to stop somebody coming round. Not, again, not necessarily planning to engage, but just providing some cover. And both of them can evade away out of trouble, which... Yes. So, so that would be the idea, would be generally a broad front, a little bit of staggering to bring flank threats into pay, play, um, and then using the general ship to do a bit of micromanagement, whether that's deployment or rallying. Are you, um, are you seeing yourself, you know, not, not game-wise defending, but, but quite literally defending with this, you know, staying in in a bit of a narrow box and, and encouraging the other person to come on to you because, and I'm looking in particular at that third command, which is your medium foot command that, that you've made that general unreliable, which is, you know, it's kind of the Richard thing um, that, that we're all picking up. But that one, if you're going forwards or trying to envelop someone, that to me looks like a command that, that is going to, if it's unreliable, it could get left behind and, and could kind of mush that. And I, when I played against these sorts of armies, when they've been most difficult to beat, they've been playing kind of defensively and saying, here's our frontage, come and, come and give it a go. Do you, how, how would you play it? On the front foot, back foot? Well, I, I try and be very disciplined. If I have an, I take an unreliable general knowing that that's a risk. So I would tend to deploy the camp towards it in order to not have it be isolated. And I just don't advance. If I've got an unreliable command, I don't advance until it becomes reliable, either by the enemy moving on to me, or that's the reason I've taken a brilliant C and C, so that I would hopefully have the ability to give it the extra dice to get a five or six rather than a six to become reliable. And it's a slow army anyway. Um, most players, if you don't advance, will advance towards you. The disadvantage is that they can choose where and they can mass against you and you have limited ability to redeploy. And that's where deploying on the table in the terrain is such a skill that you have to develop. Okay. Dave, Dave, what's your thoughts on, on looking at this one? Um, you know, I think the, the differences are that this has got a lot more commands, a um, lot more, you know, I think we're talking about who's going to be on the offensive and who's going to be on the defensive. The army list, the army I've chosen is, is completely designed to be de completely defensive. 
and to defending mountains in actual fact. So I want to break up the table and concentrate it. And as Richard says, you know, you're going to use the velites, the light infantry javelin. If, if you've got them on steep hills, they're virtually impossible to shift. If they're uphill, on a hill, on a steep hill, they can't be shifted. That, that'll hold down a flank. And I think that's going to work here with this army as well. Um, I, I agree with Richard. I think it's, it's good to do it historically. I think it's, you know, having them all armour, I think that's fair enough. And I agree with that. Um, yeah, I, I just think my army's just slightly bigger. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the kind of difference in the concept, I think. That's all. You know, Richard's got a few more light troops, a few more cavalry. Um, they're very similar in, in such and such ways. Um, one of his advantages is he's got a lot more armour in the army. Yeah, and that, that's going to make, give him a lot more punch or a lot more yeah. resilience kind of going straight through the middle, isn't it? But, but I think it's an interesting thing about both of these are are, are sort of designed to operate quasi-defensively, you know, either defending in game terms or, or just, what you're trying to do is create a narrow frontage so that yeah. that quality can can actually apply. Um, and you know, it is possible to do, but you you do have to to get that mountains. If you fall into other terrain types there's just a bit more space for people to kind of particularly out of period or if the period starts to stretch to to suddenly roll this thing up you know it, it feels both of them feel like they kind of need the table not to be 30 base widths wide but, um, and that's quite yeah. important to them which I is that's definitely i mean if, if you were fighting in planes i think then you are looking at your medium troops and your heavy swordsmen going through the terrain you know um yeah it's a big game of attrition what okay. you don't be fighting against is cavalry armies who are going to envelop you and do things like that which is always in this period whether it's carthaginians or romans their their biggest fear is someone who's got the mobility to get around their flanks yeah and i, and I think somebody um you know yeah, that's it. There are a, f a few cavalry armies, but this Camillan is just a sort of smidge before the Carthaginians, isn't it, really? Yes. Um, so so maybe it just isn't really geared up towards doing those, and it is designed to go on and take on those um, other Italian states and, and take them on frontally. And if you can squeeze the table down, um, that's, that's a good way. Okay. This means war. Right, well, look, here's the, the third one up on screen. This is mine. Um, this is my Camilla. And I think this is, this is starting to look actually a bit different um, to, <laughs> to the other two, um, which is nice to know. I've, I've played the ally card on this one, um, partly to do a similar sort of thing to, to what both Richard and Dave have done um, to create a medium foot command to, to dominate terrain. So I think we're all going to be battering each other in terrain in different ways but but what i've done here um i've got a 24 which is is the smallest one so far it's got an initiative of one which which sits in the middle of the zero and the naught um but the the sort of the central the textbook command four has start i heavy swordsman armor impact ordinary again yeah that's the punch um a couple of velites to screen do other stuff the triari in there to make that five wide of, of proper combat but then um i've used the the sensei the mediocre um sort of second rate troops and i've taken four of them as heavy spearmen which gives that command you know in our game of in our game of width um a slightly um slightly unusual nine <laughs> um, frontage four of them are, are mediocre heavy spearmen but Four of them are heavy swordsman armor impact, and and the triari as well is elite, and and kind of that that very much is the this is going to be big and wide. I'm not expecting the ascensi to to win, um, you know, if they come up against something, but but they're in that lose slowly bucket, if if that makes sense. Um, whilst buying time for the hastati and the the triari to try to do their stuff. And with a competent general as well to do that that thing of running around and, and shoring them up. Um, the Ascensi as well, because they're sort of slightly disposable, you can kind of 
and it's still a nine wide command. You can still afford to peel a couple of them off if need be and send them over probably to support the, um, the somewhat unusual first command where I've gone four cavalry, four medium cavalry, two elite, two ordinary, um, two heavy spearmen, um, ordinary, the, the principes, and I've given that a competent general because this is something I've done a, a few times is my theory being that four medium cavalry, two of which are elite, is probably not far off outmatching anyone else's cavalry wing even you know you're you're making carthaginians think twice with with that um you stick in two heavy spearmen as well if if you can neutralize or get those heavy spearmen possibly with a couple of the ascensi as well into or in front of someone else's charging cavalry suddenly you end up with either a nine wide infantry center or potentially kind of a a six seven eight wide um cavalry and anti-cavalry flank there um, with nine and six 15 wide there then the the third command I've gone for Sam Knight ally just because I think medium sword impact in a world of of medium sword or, or mediocre javelin even better um, is is just such a great extra bonus and having impact medium swordsman in in the list is is kind of a cute thing um, three three ordinary two elite i think there's an argument you can sort of eke it out to about six six ordinary impact or, or do it slightly differently and the, the horseman is is compulsory as well but but again i think i've done exactly the same as you with that third command and said look here is a um here's a command that is going to go into terrain and but i think the this army is a much more aggressive um, it is about enveloping two flanks and hoping the Hastati netting off against the Ascensi get a sort of small net win in the middle against a big infantry centre. But then the two flanking forces are there to to win and start to envelop, which is which is kind of counter counterintuitive for um, for kind of the way that that this army is normally put together so and i've i've used it a couple of times on tabletop simulator um one time it worked um very well against a, a sort of hellenistic successor army who, who who kind of all those things worked and then then one time i used it against a, an early carthaginian army and simply didn't get the terrain right and, and got the deployment wrong and um and the samnites ended up in the middle and in the open and got run over by cavalry and the game was over in in not very many turns at all so it was a bit of a, a bit of a mess up on my part with because it is sort of dependent on having having everybody wanting to put some rough terrain down and, and contest stuff so that's that's my kind of quite different way of doing it that does still sort of depend on the the hastata and the triarii and, and doing things but uses the principe spearman as as a support to make a a weirdly big cavalry command. Stun silence. Uh, <laughs> I think that looks very nice, actually. I mean, I would be tempted, I think, to actually think about moving two of the Ascensi into the first command because you, you could, you're you going to need just... You're moving with two pips anyway, one for foot and one for mounted. And nine, if you reduced... Command two to seven heavy infantry, one in the second rank. You would just increase your f speed, mm -hmm. um, and as you say, you might drift two over anyway. So, but I, I can see, as you say, that I, I definitely like the Sam Knights. Um, I think they are very attractive, um, and by using the Ascensi as heavy i think as we had in the hoplite discussion i think there's a lot of merit in that as well um yeah no i, I can see that putting you know i think possibly with the uh, there's a bit of psychology or certainly when i deployed it there was a bit of psychology that, that i dropped that first command down um sorry that second command i, I dropped down first and yeah and people are like oh my god that's enormous and four of them are rubbish <laughs> Um, what the hell are you doing? But that really, 
zones in the you know suddenly the the mindset of your opponent is like i've got to deal with this really wide command but i'm going to do that bit of it so yes drifting the ascend site out of that um to then support the the other command uh, and again it's still only got a initiative of one so so it, it, it is kind of something att- asking the enemy to attack you um yep. in a way and then enveloping them with with that cavalry command um on no, i see that, that too cavalry. so there's there's a bit of weird psychology in having those those together and, and just going oh my god that's nine wide what, what the hell are you doing you idiot um but yeah that that's the that's the theory dave you're um you're looking quizzical. Uh, um, I, I think I like, I like it. I like the, the cavalry focus is really good. I mean, it's, it's actually, it's weirdly, it's kind of a Dave type RV with the first command of the four cavalry uh, and, you know, a lot of manoeuvre there and the thing. Um, I'm, I was sitting here, I'm just sitting here looking at the list. The reason I'm looking quizzical is I'm thinking, how can I make a general included in command number one? And use the point, the three points somewhere else to try and build up the ascent side um, to be better or something like that. But that's it's quite difficult. I think um, um, I think one of the issues with sticking an included general in that command one is you will quite quickly find you're moving two spearmen and then the cavalry separately as well because it's an enveloping yeah, thing. I agree. Yeah, so yeah. getting a you know you're you're not really needing that extra plus for fighting. Um, if anything, there's possibly I don't know. Can the generals go in the Hastati? No, no, no they can only go. In, fine, if they only go in the cavalry, if they only go in the cavalry, you keep them out. Then, yeah, if you only go in the cavalry, you keep them separate because the cavalry are just. It doesn't matter which of those four are fighting as long as only two or three of them are. Uh, <laughs> and the issue is you've got two spare. There's there's actually a very Tim trick there to have the four cavalry and a couple of heavy foot with them coming up in, with them because if you are facing a cavalry command your opponent's cavalry command does not want to be facing heavy spearmen no no so, and, and two, two elite medium cavalry are not bad in this period anyway oh yeah, yeah they're, exactly. they're pretty sensible yeah. so yeah. um I, and I think those two heavy spearmen in the first command could end up being the troops which do end up doing the outflanking so yeah I, I agree with you there probably you are right not to include a general um, I, I just include a general just to save points and, um, you know, see if I can use them somewhere else. That, you know, we're getting a feel for it. I, I, I like the Sam Knight Army. I did come up with one list which was illegal. Which yeah, was I think it's easy to do, Sam isn't Knight. it, for this? I, like, I think the Sam Knight's a very, very good option. Um, I, I, would like to try, I would have liked to try and put a way into them. Um, I yeah, I, I, looked, I looked at the um, all of the allies across these two lists and medium swordsman impact elite is just such a good troop type that i thought you know getting five of those or five impact anyway two elite just should make you better than than anything and i'd I'd, I'd be reasonably confident even against your seven wide with with those five that they could they could do something in that medium cavalry trick although the sam knights are forced to do it because it's compulsory um, it's, you know, like, this means war. This means war. We, we've covered off the Camillans then, and um, we're now moving up a few hundred years to the Republicans. So this is this is an army that starts to get more toys, but is still built around that same core. And um, Richard, let's start with yours. You've you, you've bumped the initiative up to three. Um, I'm looking at this and guessing that's possibly we're allowed two new medium cavalry somewhere. Um, and and you've bumped the element count up to 27, which which is starting to get pretty chunky as well. You've got a 10, a 12, and then a micro command of of four. That's that's a couple of cavalry and a couple of light horse. So um, your 10 and your 12. Talk us through those. They've they've both got brilliant generals as well. So, yeah, I mean, the, the theory of, of this army um, is, start with a micro command first in a way, that's as a four, it can all be hidden behind a hill, it can flank march, um, and although it's not brilliant, 
by making the general elite and included, you know, against a lot of the in-period opponents, that's got quite a bit of punch. And the light cavalry allow you to delay or go for a camp or, or whatever. I would normally then deploy command two in the middle. And that's the, and one, with, um, I'm just that's the one with the elephant. That's the um, elephant, okay. So that's got, you've got this with that legion structure as well, four Hastati, one yeah, three RE. Uh, um, very much stuck to the le legion structure. So this has basically got a legion and some allies. Depending on the terrain, what I would normally plan to do though, if I felt my cavalry were likely to be outclassed, which is very likely against, uh, unless it's a sort of infantry-led opponent, I would put the two impetuous swordsmen in the, in the element tiny Death Star next to the cavalry, just, okay. just to sort of put off a stronger mounted opponent, then have a legion, and then have the first command with the mediocre legion um, with the two medium swordsmen able to hold a, a bit of flank. That's so right. I would, it, for my terrain pieces, I would be looking to put down small pieces, you know, towards minimum size, two to three wide, um, rather than going for big pieces. This is an army which will spread over most of the table. You know, I think it can... You know, it isn't 30 wide, but it can cope with a 30 wide table fairly comfortably. Uh, you know, unless you're facing Mongols or something. Um, the I've saved points by going for a, a hasty legion uh, and having four of the, the legionaries be mediocre. Um, that's in your first command, isn't it? Yeah, that's in the, that's in the first command. Again, uh, you know, it's got a it's got a cavalry and the two medium swordsmen, again, to act as sweepers. You know, it's just this theory of you put the heavy infantry in a line and you advance, and then the sweepers can move to terrain, they can move to outflank, they can support another command, uh, which is why I've only included a general in the micro command, where, again, if he dies, there's probably not a lot left to command anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I suppose so. And, um, and those mediocre... Heavy swordsman impact mediocre is kind of an intriguing troop type, isn't it? Because mediocre does only kick in if you roll good dice. Um, and heavy swordsman impact are, are going to be on a decent factor against most things. And they've got, got resilience. So it's, it's a kind of, you know, the higher factor you start with, the, least, the less important mediocre is in some ways. Yes. And, and, you know, you're hoping to win on the first round but at the end of the day, I see that Legion as it's there to die slowly, a bit as we've yeah. had the comments before. I'm not expecting to win with that. And again, that's why I've made that the unreliable command, you know, in a sense of if it goes unreliable, well, my opponent probably will be Wants to in fight a dilemma. It. Does he attack it or not? Because it's yeah. the weaker one. Um, so again, I don't really mind whether it goes unless i've deployed badly i don't mind whether it's unreliable or yeah and then, and then that second command as you say is is almost the textbook um classic era one general two movement units of of a death star plus a couple of bits and then five heavy infantry um yes. as well so you you have got two you've really got four solid movement groups there and and a couple of sweepers as well that does even if you start to spread them out or they drift, you know, one, one base width or so either time, you are covering quite a lot of table with your, with your 27 of which yeah. what only three of them are only no five of them are light infantry. So you're, you're kind of 22 of stuff that is just well, about 21 because one's in the camp. Oh, one's in the camp, isn't it? 21 uh, to, to do that. All right, Dave, um, you know, it looks like a, a very, solid you know you'd be happy taking on carthaginians and other people with that actually even even some of the classical ones dave what, what's your thoughts um i i would worry about, i mean I, I get the penal uh, legion the uh, heavy swordsman impact mediocre i would worry about them i mean i think having two of them as mediocre is one thing but having four mediocres is trouble brewing 
and uh, especially if it's an unreliable command, if that is towards one flank and is unreliable, then something's going to maneuver to a point to get right round it. And I, I think that could end up in big trouble. I presume, Richard, that's going down the centre? No, that would be on a flank. Yeah. So it, 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 if, it, if it's got a hard flank, it's not so bad. If it's on a coast or something like that, it's OK. But if it's hanging out in a flank, it's got a bit of trouble to it. Um, somebody could get manoeuvre past and actually charge in with the cavalry. So, um, yeah, I think, um, I think, you know, we've both gone for the elephant just because it's there and possible. Um, yeah, the elephant's a tease, isn't it? It's, you know, it's, it's so obvious that you want to have it, um, but it is still a mediocre elephant, but it's got, got those, um, you know, impetuous sword either side. It's a pretty classic Death Star, but yeah. it does, if it's got impetuous troops, it means you're going forwards with those, doesn't it? Yeah, I think, you know, Richard's at list is one minute. The interesting one is the cavalry command. That's going to manoeuvre and really go for a flank. I, I, would, I would wonder if he's got enough actual impact going forward with just the four heavy swordsman impacts. And I, I would, I, myself, I would deeply worry about having four mediocre heavy swordsmen. Um, yeah, but I suppose it's yeah because that middle command's got four Hastar type impact, which are good. Traori's five. The Death Star takes you up to eight. Um, yeah, so you're going in with eight things there, plus a couple of the heavy cavalry are pretty good. But it's whether those eight have got enough speed to punch through, and then your your mediocre guys. You know, I, I don't think they're that bad. The mediocre because because they only you know lose the. Well, the mediocre only kicks in when they're rolling good dice, but but it's whether eight or nine is actually quite enough quality punch to to win when the other stuff is yeah, exactly. is slightly more flaky. But but my view like would be work. if you're facing somebody with better quality, then they're likely to be shorter. You know, they they're, they're likely to have a, a line of fourteen or whatever, and at that point, I would hope that those two medium swordsmen would be beginning to threaten the flank. I mean, I had a game on TTS with it against a Carthaginian army, which had loads of cavalry and armoured infantry. Um, and, you know, the elephant neutralised the opposition cavalry. The second, le the better legion took the brunt, but then actually the mediocre ones came in with overlaps and won. Okay, so those yeah, it's, it's the overlaps that you're allowed to do it. So it's it, yeah, it's it's whether it risks maybe they you know paraphrase what you're saying slightly differently. It's whether it just risks falling between the two stools of width and punch. You know, it, it's a balanced army, um, which having those two second death stars do it. And and I guess perhaps this is just taking a step back from uh, after two or three weeks of us all looking down um, down the barrel of how do we make these unusual armies work we've we've sort of got a bit to two extremes of you either go mega punch or you go mega width um, and seeing something in the middle that's that's got balance and flexibility is is possibly kind of a bit of a reset button so yeah you know you there's a lot of stuff you could use here to create those those overlaps and opportunities and and it's just getting back into that mindset of this is an army that's got enough toys to be played with rather than running on autopilot. And it has the command and control to actually use the toys. That's the key thing. I, this, this army with, with less command and control, I would be more worried about. Yeah, because yeah, they, they do start to get some good, um, good quality generals into, um, into these particular Roman armies in this era as well. That means for sure. Then look, we're um, on five out of six then in this um, Roman epic, this this epic Roman campaign to um, to conquer Italy and, and take on all their enemies around the Mediterranean with two different armies. So Dave, this is your Republican list, and, and this is the one where you've played the, the ally card. Um, an Italian ally in, in Core 3. You've got initiative of three um, this time, 24 units, a seven, a 12, um, and a four. And um, you know, your your first one is 
is the, almost a textbook legion, um, sort of. You've got four Hastati elite. Wow, that's that's impressive. So, so yeah, talk us through, um, I'm guessing that first one, um, four elite heavy swordsman impact, three Velites, two of which are elite. Is that driving straight down the middle? Yeah, that's that's going straight down the middle. That's my first command. That's, that's as you say, the hammer or the anvil. Even the uh, ordinary included general, full full fact, yeah, just go full, for it, yeah. Well, you know, he, he's there, he's got one job, he's going he's gonna to win for that group. You've yep. got um, enough Velites to protect them going in because we don't have armour, but their job is to just go damn straight forward. Um, there is one other option with that one, which I was hoping if I was going to fight in mountains or something, I've got three Velites there, two of which are elite. They can hold a hill with a, a steep hill or a piece of steep of difficult terrain without any problem whatsoever so they can hold a forest they can sit in an ambush in a forest they can sit there whilst the hastati go forward on their own or something like that so there, there's an option there to hold a flank with that command um okay then the, se the second command is my strategist so here well, hey, absolutely uh, the, the, the idea 12, yep the idea is that this command is going to be able to operate in effect as two commands, if need be, if probably in the likelihood. Yeah. And um, your 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 Death Star's got um, the extraordinary medium swordsman armor elite, um, rather yeah. than the the impetuous impact foot. Then, um, well, it, so you've it's got, got an armor. You've got. It's got. I mean, for the first thing, the elephant's got a elite Cretan to protect him. So I'm hoping that elite Cretan will get me my elephant closer to the enemy than most. Because the one thing you don't want is your elephant to be shot at by yeah. other people. Not um, a mediocre one, yeah. yeah. I mean, if the option is there to have the elephant, you know, if it, here, I think I've got an option here. I can either have the elephant with Italian ally medium swordsman, so it's kind of a weak Death Star, if need be, or I can have a very strong um, Death Star using the Extraordinarii. Okay. So actually, you know, yeah, you've got five medium swordsmen there and the yeah. elephant and the four heavy swordsmen impact and the, the Triarii. So that's almost three groups, isn't it? You know, you could exactly. do three medium foot, the Death Star three wide, and then five wide for the, the heavy foot, which it's got a strategist, but yeah, three, either flanks down the middle. That's, yeah, there's a lot of combat within that one. I think that there's a lot of options in there. I mean, that, that's, my, you know, when in this area of periods, um, you know, the Carthaginian can be quite flexible. I wanted to put quite a bit of flexibility into this army. And yet that, set, that middle command has still got four, has started four impacts heavy foot in there as well, and a triari. So it's got, you know, you, you, I've got the option of putting command one, you know, and getting myself with eight Hastati together going forward, four of which are elite. So that's my, you know, the option. The weakness of the army is that you then have the Aetolian ally, <coughs> which is um, only four, four troops. Um, but this is, is, I think, you know, we've used this before as well, Tim, haven't yeah. we? And we, we what, I think we, we tend to call it a dicking around command. It's a dicking around command, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Dicking around command. So you want to deploy this possibly last, and you want it to put it maybe a third of the way into the table from one edge. And all his job is there is just to slow down the enemy, dick around, cause problems. You know, you've got a light, I mean, having a light cavalry general, it seems a very odd thing, but his only job is to get round the flank or run away. So, yeah, you, this, this was, um, I think I used this in that, um, Galatian, um, exactly, yeah. Galatian army. And, um, the interesting thing about using a command like this is it looks on paper like something that should be racing round a flank and being very wide and being yeah. up front, but. But what it actually is, um, is a command that, that the other two commands get engaged and soak up the enemy's attention. And then um, this thing arrives. So it almost hangs back a bit. Um, and it only kind of comes into play when, when you know that um, 
anything in the enemy's army that's going to cause it trouble is already busy. Um, and then it suddenly appears and it's like, aha, you know, we're, we're four extra width of stuff that can run away or shoot or, or overlaps or turn flanks or things. But, but the secret is not to throw it forward. So having no. it allied, um, obviously it is allied, but, um, but having it potentially something that, that lurks back is, is kind of a, a left field option. And, you know, and as you say, deploying it last is a, still a surprise because people are, are going to be expecting more Romans really, aren't they? Well, the, it, it's a choice it, again it's a, you're absolutely right I agree with everything you just said but the other I mean I've also learned this from Julian Julian uses this with his Roman army Julian Lopez who's a very good player he used mm. you know when I fought him with a Roman army this is what he did and he will have that totally in an ambush if he can get it into behind a hill in a forest in a plantation even better you know it you can sit there and then your, your opponent's going oh is he flank marching is he in the ambush what what's he doing and then if that can come out of an ambush and then race for the round the sides you know with the light cavalry moving incredible and if that light cavalry general with another light cavalry hits something in the flank it's hitting a flank with a javelin the general and an overlap so it's actually quite destructive in actual fact and all all of that group can run away so you, you know you may end up sacrificing the javelin men and hoping you get away with the light cavalry but it's, it, as we say, it's a dicking around command. It's there to cause a lot of problems and, you know, give the width and cause issues. Um, and it's a way of saving armies so you get that strategist in. So in actual fact, I'm hoping that I'm actually operating with four commands in actual fact. Yeah, for, well, possibly even five in some ways. Yeah. Exactly. With, with three in that middle one. Richard, what's, what's your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the pluses is it's fairly untypical um, and therefore somebody's going to have to stop and think rather than roll out their standard game plan and that's always a big plus. Um, it's got a lot of fighting power, it's got a, a lot of breadth. I don't see um, I don't see any particular issue. I guess with core one, you know if core one is in the center, that means it's prob you know it's got core three on one flank. Core one is is elite. I would just be a bit worried about somebody being able to get around its flank, not necessarily to be able to beat it up, but just by being there in threatening, perhaps slowing it down, bogging it down without uh, and core three isn't enough of a threat to maybe displace somebody in that position. So, and that would then allow someone to focus on core two, but core two strong. So, yeah. you know, yeah, you can focus on it, but you've got a hard time beating it. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I suppose maybe, maybe putting that a different way. You, Dave, you've got core one is one core and core two with your strategist is three. Um, yes. potentially um, yeah. and it's whether it's better to operate it as two and two just gives yeah. you a bit more flexibility at deployment um, I think I think core two may well have to do some 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 maneuvering while stationary to protect core three or core one so yeah. it may be that the medium inf the medium swordsman the three Italian allies have got to go off somewhere to be a sacrifice or all the elephants is going to have to manoeuvre round core one. You know, you may be mm. sitting there in a really strange deployment situation where you de you, you're going to move your elephant, you know, your Death Star round the first core to sit between three. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so, but that's, that's the point of having the strategist is, you know, that, you know, that I think the strategist's importance is getting all that manoeuvre in. Yeah, no, no I, I, I can just about see it. I think I'm, I'm still, yeah, scratching my head whether it'd be better as set up as effectively two and two. I, I think I'd also wonder whether that that second core with eleven combat troops and only one skirmishing screening like foot, even though they are elite, whether just taking a second one out of the first command and giving yourself two would sure. just be better. You know, one elite Cretan, it's elite, it's a Cretan, but it's one covering a frontage of 11, which might be a bit of a stretch. 
you know, it, yeah, it, it could it's get most. Study there to, to work the elephant. Study there to work the elephant. Yeah, you're you're just relying on the rest of them, just kind of being and, in there. The other thing there is, you know, you can sit there and say, right, the elephant just sits back, and then I I'm going to come forward with uh, four elite Hastati. True. Four, yeah. Four elite Hastati, one Triari, and two extraordinary armored medium swordsmen. You yeah, know, and all of a sudden you've got another. You, you know, I, I think it's a very good army. I think it's got an interesting potential. So can't wait to use it. No, I must admit, I'm looking. At, I'm looking at this and thinking, um, Mark, because I've got obviously way too many for for this. Um, I think they're old glory Roman um, infantry, yeah, yeah. and I'm just thinking some of them need to be rebased as medium foot um, to possibly get a different shield pattern or something like that, so that they can appear as. Italian allies or all sorts of other things because they all look the bloody same, didn't they? Really, in that day. Um, yeah, so Italian let's... ally is always good fun to play with because I, 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 I'm increasingly playing with this sort of micro command who's messing people around. I do it with other armies, and, it, and it's actually just really good fun to play with. This means war. So look, to finish up then, um, this is the sixth one. And this is my, um, again, left field Republican Roman. If we've had two fairly textbook armies, this is the non-textbook army. And I think this, Dave, you mentioned um, Julian. This is attempting to sort of channel one of his things. Um, You guys have gone clever, manoeuvre, good command. Um, I've gone good initiative, but ridiculous width on this one by managing to eke out somehow 30 units in this <laughs> army with an initiative of three and a strategist. Um, and what I've done is I've just stacked up quite a lot of mediocre, but also quite a lot of um, heavy foot and, and, and other things to just go forwards on a broad frontage and a bit like some of the hoplite armies from last week, maybe I'd still got that in my mind, just to try and engage people with a lot of, four hit point reasonably dangerous but not necessarily great quality troops so so there's two commands of of 12 and uh and a sub general of five you know maybe easier to start with the sub general of five which is a a pretty textbook possibly slightly bigger than other people if you're lucky cavalry command um one elite heavy cavalry with an included general same as you richard um two medium cavalry ordinary and two Numidians, so that can sort of fight, but it, it does what that cavalry command does. But but the issue is that they're doing what they do with 24 other um, infantry, <laughs> pretty much in the other other two commands. So um, looking at the the first one with a strategist in it, um, and I think, again, there's, there's probably an argument for putting the strategist in different places, but, but I wanted to to have him for the extra points and the extra initiative so two ordinary hastarity and principes impact um two velites ordinary two three mediocre medium swordsmen which is starting to be i think like your um camilla this day just get a lot of stuff in in terrain so this is a command that that potentially sits on a terrainy sort of flank so you've got three mediocre medium swordsmen two impetuous medium swordsman two javelin men as well so that's giving you a width of seven of stuff to go into terrain and and another velite so three velites in there as well so it's two heavy infantry in the open seven medium foot who can all do various quantities of stuff in in rough terrain the the scutari could possibly come out into the open a bit as well because they're impetuous and going to provide a bit of grunt and that's that's nine wide of things that can have a bit of a go at fighting um the the second one is is the stand in the center command and again it's gone for width um four mediocre hastartian principes heavy swordsman impact haven't gone for the armor just just get the width there's four of those two gallic warriors heavy swordsman impetuous to give it a bit of a cutting edge takes you up to six um two more triarii who are really going to drift over and try and support the cavalry to to take it up to eight and then four um skirmishers to to screen these these slightly squishy 
um, infantry and, and possibly actually even start to gang up on on other people's ones and twos and try and pick up start that war of attrition early because ultimately this is trading off the fact that it's 30 30 big um and and just using an awful lot of of width with with eight eight heavy infantry in um, no 10 heavy infantry in the middle of, of mixed quality and seven medium foot on the flank and then a, a cavalry command that that possibly gets supported so i i ducked the elephant i think the elephant is so um so so compelling that it was almost an exercise to say can you do this list without it because otherwise you start with legion plus death star plus this and then suddenly you're you've you've filled most of the slots and most of the points anyway so so losing the elephant was was a bit of an academic exercise to see if i can i can make an army without it but <clears throat> and i think looking at it i was um i kind of almost expected to be able to get more heavy infantry i was slightly surprised how how few i ended up and, and maybe there's a different list that i'm thinking of that, that gets even more of these mediocres but but just 30 is a big number to wade through um and if it can throw itself into into the enemy with what two three four five six seven eight nine 13 14 15 16 17 about 20 width of stuff that is just about prepared to fight in the right circumstances um it, it starts to be an interesting interesting um academic challenge for for an army that can play play on rails and and start rolling dice but it might be rubbish i'm just not sure <laughs> i think it would be interesting to see on the table i, I mean I like this idea of using quite a few mediocre troops. I just question whether or not they work better with four really good troops somewhere in the battle line to really pressure the opponent rather than just attrition. Mm -hmm. and, and you've also got a slight problem in that you can only have zero to two of the Spanish plus Ligurians plus Gauls. Okay. So you, you, you need to tweak it a bit. But as you say, you can replace them with mediocre heavy swords and impact or whatever. Um, but other than that, I think, you know, I think the, I think the concept, um, the concept is, is, is interesting. As you say, you take out the elephant, you replace it with more heavy infantry, um, and you you know it's going to give people a hard time um the strategists gives gives you a lot of command and control it would be that middle one um you know it doesn't have that much command and control it's quite a lot of wits but you've got the cavalry on the outside so yeah yeah i, well, I think that's the one that you're just throwing at people and letting them letting them deal with it in, in some yes. ways it's the one that can afford to can afford to lose and you're trying to um, you know engineer more of a win on the flanks i think sure strategist the issue is to make sure that you do get enough terrain on one flank of a type that your your massed medium infantry can go into and and it will draw someone else to put their smaller medium infantry group into it and that's kind of where you where you start to win um you know, you're asking people to deal with the the central command but it doesn't have to race forwards because you've just got so many medium infantry on on that first command and the cavalry side of it in period isn't isn't too bad either particularly with with a couple of you know potentially those two triari as i did with the first list drifting out to support them to give yes. you a a five wide bit of combat against enemy mounted so if you, if you can pull people into that um you know command in the middle and, and make them fight it further up the table you are doing that sort of you know envelopment piece mm. quite naturally yeah i think if you've got a hard piece of terrain or a coast and you can put your unreliable general against that with your weaker heavy foot and then you can put your strategist in the center and your cavalry on the other flank then you're looking at a very powerful army. I mean, let's face it, with 13 units in the army, you're not going to lose your army very often. 
<laughs> it's a matter you of know, that's, that's a good point about about the center because i think that's one of the things that it's very easy to forget you can sometimes get kind of a a rough terrain motorway down the middle of the table that's and nice. if you're dominating that suddenly you're creating all sorts of problems for people who can't go into it at all um the, the challenge with this kind of structure is if you end up with quite a lot of rough on one flank and then another significant piece, say that's on the right flank, and then there's another reasonable sized piece on the left center, which you know I quite often yeah. seem to end up, you've got no medium foot. You, you, if you've either then forced to put the strategist in the center, or if you've got two and three, and the enemy's got two or three medium foot in that, you're, they've got a kind of castle that you're going to find hard to tackle. Yes, you've got the four light infantry, which can at least pepper him and keep him tied up. Um, but yeah, you know, no, every think, army has those kind of situations. Yeah. It's all about, you know, there, no army is perfect. And I think a lot of what we've been doing over the last few weeks has been looking at, at armies that you might take to a, you know, a three game one day competition. Yes. You, cre you create something that's a lot more lopsided than maybe you would normally do for a you know two day five game six game thing yes because, because you're you're trying to catch two out of three people out and you're you're not too worried you know you've not wasted too much of your life if it doesn't work at all yeah um, absolutely and, and you're just giving yourself and your opponent some some interesting tactical problems with it with um with the sheer mass of it but you know it was just this was very much digging to see if there's a different way of doing this than legion plus death star plus some cavalry you know it's yes. a, to, and and taking the elephant out of the mix really does tip you in a different direction um just by by taking the death star off the table yes and getting to 30 is immediately gives your opponent a huge mountain to climb yeah <laughs> yeah psychologically as well as, as although possibly with some of these troops they could just walk up to it and push it over <laughs> um, which is which is a lot easier than climbing it I think in a competition game, it's very easy to sit there and look for a balanced army and sit there and say, right, I've got both flanks protected. I tend not to do that. Um, I tend to take a risk with one flank and then really have one side of the table where I can go and get myself a win. Yeah, because you know, ultimately uh, these are seven, seven or eight six seven or eight turn games, aren't they? So, yeah. so leaving a flank sort of open you know, someone still has to move troops up to there, get them around it and, and start doing something about it. You've yeah. got to be very committed even to take advantage of a of an open flank. I'll tend to put the infantry command on, say, on, on one flank, you know, even though you're leaving it open to have to being outflanked itself, but then put the elephants in the centre and cavalry on the outside so that the elephants and the cavalry are going to come rushing down on anybody and deliver a really major blow. As you say, it's a seven or eight game move. Um, it's a seven or eight turn game. If you go yeah. quick and hard, you can get yourself a big win before you get toppled over. Yeah, oh, interesting. Well, look, that's um, that's six lists and six um, pretty different ways of putting these together. I think this exercise of of trying to do it again kind of pulls up more interesting ways of of breaking past that I can only do it one way and it's not going to work um thing with with both of these lists which has been been interesting to do um as well so i think you know, this this one seems <laughs> quite a long one we've we've actually talked quite a long time about um armies which only really have one core troop type the legion um but once again um thanks dave thanks richard and um we'll be digging in the book for some more obscure stuff to um to come up with these army lists particularly now that we're all in in super mega lockdown yet again um and we're locked here with with little else to do other than, than go through the army list and record these podcasts for you. So thank you very much and um, see you on the next one. Have fun. Bye-bye. Cheers.